Welcome to the Robotics for Infectious Diseases interview with Dr. Antonio Bici. Dr. Bici is a professor of robotics at the University of Pisa, and he's going to share with us a presentation of the experiences so far by the Italian Institute of Robotics and Intelligent Machines on using robots for COVID. Thank you for being here, Antonio. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, for inviting me. Well, shall we get started with your presentation? So I have a presentation to share with you that uh, is about, uh, basically it's two parts. Uh, I will speak about uh, something general that our community in Italy has done. Uh, and, uh, and then I will dive a little bit more in the details of some uh, robotic uh, implementations that we, have, uh, that we have done. So first of all, let me uh, spend a few words about um, uh, who we are. I'm uh, speaking at the beginning uh, as the president of this Institute of Robotics and Intelligent Machines, which is something that we, that we established in Italy mainly with the purpose of speaking to the public of what robotics and intelligent machines can do for the society. Um, uh, we consider robotics as AI flashed out in, you know, in applications where you need a body to do something intelligent, to perceive and to uh, react uh, in the environment. So this is uh, something that we started uh, only in, in 2019, and the goal of was communicating to industry and society and leaders what robotics uh, can really do. Uh, there are a number of robotics but uh, people that you might have uh, known of, but uh, basically the whole community in Italy is, uh, uh, is involved. Uh, we had a nice event in October 2019 with 500 registrants, thousand, uh, several, thousands of, uh, several tens of thousands of visitors in a, a robotics exhibit that we had at Maker Fair. So everything was going nicely and smoothly when uh, uh, in February uh, we started realizing that uh, the virus was coming. Uh, it was uh, the first Western country that was hit that hard in, in, uh, in, in, in this year and uh, it rapidly, rapidly spread and we went under lockdown uh, at the end of February, basically early March. So the community organized uh, uh, itself to start giving a, a response. Uh, we had daily meetings from the end of February until mid-April and then uh, weekly uh, continuing. We devised a, a strategy with three main lines. Uh, we decided the first and foremost action was to listen to the needs that came from society and then provide responses in the short term and also look forward uh, in the mid long term what robotics can do in this case. Um, there, has, there are expectations in the society. We cannot uh, uh, conceal the fact that uh, people are used to listen about uh, beautiful stories of robots, but then when uh, a need is there, uh, not always we are ready to, uh, to do what we somehow have promised. So there was some news, uh, for instance, here is a, a, a news that were uh, you know, very prominent on the, on the major newspaper in Italy. The title was, uh, where did the robots end up? And it, as you can see here is a translation. Uh, you know, not every now and then I find myself wondering, but these famous robots, now that they are needed, where they did end up? And why aren't they in hospitals where doctors and nurses risk their lives? Why don't they deliver groceries home? Why don't they keep the elderly company? Uh, we didn't need this kind of press to start working. Unfortunately, we had answers to these questions. So again, we had already started, uh, first of all, to listen to the needs. So I think this was important. We interviewed many that were you know, exposed to the risks in the clinics, in the hospitals, in the elderly care homes that have been a focus of the uh, contagion. And we also had questions. We came up with uh, um, many answers, and uh, we had uh, you know, tools for analyzing these answers that were mostly uh, free text, not to bias uh, the, the outcomes with our own uh, prejudice. And uh, out of that, we came out with answers that uh, uh, drove us 
towards some goals. So for instance, in COVID, we realized that uh, um, uh, something important was uh, the, the, the presence, the, the um, isolation of patients. Some other things that we thought were important were less important than, than, uh, than, than those things that were uh, suggested to us. So that informed some of our research that I will show later on. Now in this uh, phase where we are now restarting cautiously in, in, in Italy, at least, we have much less uh, contagions now. Uh, is uh, uh, now very, very little. We are down the hill, fortunately. So we have less attention to acute clinical conditions now, more social interaction. There are jobs that involve physical interaction with objects and people that require to be restarted. And then we prepare, prepare the new questionnaire uh, together with industry representatives, unions, and also social scientists and psychologists to make those uh, well posed. And we are now uh, circulating this questionnaire to understand what is needed now in this phase. But let's go ahead and tell you a little bit of the story. So the question that uh, the press, the society, the, the, the public opinion asked us were, what can you do with your robots? And in the heat of the contagion, we thought that we should provide solutions that were available, deployable, and reliable and make their use possible to normal people, even under lockdown. Um, it was not a, a matter of rocket science. We didn't have, we couldn't actually bring our best robots to help, but uh, they had to be useful. So it, was, it took some humility, if you want, to go back and try to find those technologies that could be deployed now at that time and wherever needed not just near our universities, not just in our labs, not just one hospital, but in as many as possible. So to do this, the question is, how, do you, how can you do this? Because our community is mainly made of, of uh, uh, researchers and of course some industrialists, but uh, there is no uh, such a number as to cover for the many hundreds of hospitals and hundreds of thousands of people that were affected. So we thought that uh, it would be a good idea to have a coalition with people that are uh, more numerous and are uh, strong with technical skills. They have the ability to build and operate technology. They are many and they are distributed all over, all over the country and they have a, a volunteering spirit. Uh, and this is the, the makers community. So there is a strong makers community in Italy. We have a maker fair in Rome that is the largest worldwide after the San Mateo original one in the United States. And so we made this um, coalition with them. Uh, we, we thought that to make technology available and deployable, uh, we could work with the makers and with uh, all other partners interested to uh, merge needs, solutions, and the ability to build and realize. So the idea was basically that uh, researchers could provide solutions together with makers and uh, matching those needs that were coming from our uh, investigations and interviews, and then have uh, and find people that were close to hospitals, maybe in the, you know, in, in nine or in, in, not in the major cities, in the uh, local uh, territories where they could develop and deploy the solutions. And you have a number of projects here that were made uh, available to the community to build. We have a few examples here, of course, uh, these facial shields, pole splitter connectors, facial masks, all these kinds of things. Um, some other projects, uh, open projects, uh, such as this one for doing sanitization inside hospital with uh, 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 UVC. But I will now go into more details in a project that we did uh, with our group of research. And now I, I wear a different hat. Uh, this is a project that we did under this uh, IREM uh, scheme with the Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia, Italian Institute of Technology, and the University of Pisa, together with hospitals and uh, other partners. Uh, it's called LHF Connect. 
And LHF stands for uh, low hanging fruits. Um, again, we needed to go in the real places where the need was with technology that was ready and could be deployed. So we thought, why don't we just re reach at the low hanging fruits from the work that we have been doing in the past decades and are now there. So we, uh, through our questionnaires and interviews, we realized that there was a, a large number of people that was hospitalized uh, that were unable to use technology autonomously because either they were elderly or you know, otherwise unable to operate a call or most often immobilized because of respiratory, respiratory aids and tests. Uh, so they were isolated from their families for weeks. Um, they were, you know, I knew people that were basically kidnapped from, from their family because when the, the, the virus uh, came to strike them, they had to be hospitalized and they didn't see or talk to their families for weeks. Sometimes they were unable to say goodbye to the community. And that was moving. That was something that we didn't know. We learned through uh, interview the, the personnel in the hospitals. Uh, doctors and nurses are overloaded. They really don't need to spend time near patients to hold a tablet for them to communicate. Also, patients need their privacy during that. So this uh, LHF uh, Connect idea was a, a very simple thing. Um, telepresence is in big demand for those patients. Uh, they, there are no telepresence robots available in large quantities. Of course, there are commercial products, but they were only very few available at the time of quarantine in Italy that you can have, really. So only very few of them. On the other hand, we knew that there were vacuum cleaners in large stock. Amazon and all the e-commerce had many, many robotic vacuum cleaners. So the idea was to modify the existing hardware with new open software, make the project open and available to makers to build. Um, of course, we spoke with manufacturers of uh, uh, vacuum cleaners. We had to modify the software completely and luckily, we had the opening of those manufacturers. In particular, iRobot was uh, courteous enough to give us uh, the possibility to open the software and to use the Roomba as a robot. So LHF Connect is this fully documented open project to build a telepresent robot with available hardware that you can simply order from Amazon in any place uh, in the world, and then download your open software the cost is around 1,000 euros, and uh, there are full instruction manuals, software, uh, and uh, instructions on how to sanitize the robot, how to uh, build uh, models, and uh, fr frequent task questions, and so on and so forth. Um, the, uh, here is a video of, uh, of, this, uh, of, this, of this robot. In a second, it will come. So here are a few more details or pictures of the system. Uh, here is a, uh, the list of uh, components that you can download and then you have links to uh, Amazon, for instance, where you can order the parts and that will make your, your, uh, your, your product. So you can order these parts, just have them delivered and then build them. This is the software interface that we have uh, prepared. Uh, of course, it's integrating other applets. In this case, it's a, a Zoom interface, a WhatsApp for uh, patients and, and, and their relatives. And we use uh, uh, existing and newly developed software. Uh, this is a typical call cycle. And this is the typical day that we analyze for organizing the logistics of managing the robot inside the COVID areas of the hospital. Basically, the idea is that there is uh, the patient, uh, here are pictures of the robot in the COVID area of our hospitals here. And here is a, a, a video. Robbie, can you hear the sound? Yes, we can. I hope you can hear the sound. Yes, good. So. Of course, most of you cannot understand Italian, but you can read the, the, the captions. 
And let me insist, this is a very simple idea. This is nothing that another third presence robot couldn't do. But this robot could be done anywhere, can be built also now when there is a need uh, without having to um, to make them build uh, on purpose uh, from a company because now they are uh, they, they could not deliver at that time. Here it goes. So it was a, a, a nice and, and a pretty large effort, but it was very rewarding when we put these people again in connection with their families. It was not. A, it is not the only purpose where a telepresence robot can help. For instance, here is another video showing remote monitoring, another application. Where you can see that the robot uh, moves um, and uh, a doctor that is not in the same part of the hospital and is outside the COVID area can check the conditions of the patient. Here is a, a patient that is being ventilated, it's intubated, and you can check the, uh, the, 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 the monitors, can correspond with nurses, can also talk to the patient. we can stop it. Uh, an interesting thing is this uh, robot can be replicated uh, uh, everywhere, um, as a, by the way, a little cost. For instance, here is a version that was uh, made in, the, in Lombardy. As you know, this is the most uh, severely affected region in Italy. And this uh, early care home built uh, the robot in complete autonomy without ever uh, meeting us. Um, uh, basically only using the instructions manuals that were uh, that are available on right, or, or online and so the same can be done everywhere in the world of course everything is uh, multi-language as I say that was a pretty intense efforts in uh, uh, in two three weeks uh, uh, it was a lot of work by a large team that I thank uh, dearly so um, let me move a little bit forward now with the uh, a look to the future. In Italy, as I said, we are now restarting the economy. We are uh, uh, closing the lockdown phase and we can look forward, but things will not uh, uh, go back to uh, as they were, as they used to be. Things will change probably for a long time, perhaps for good. So we, had uh, these other activities of uh, finding what are the projects that are not available today but they could become available shortly. So the pilot projects that were uh, high technology readiness level already proven in clinical or lab environment maybe not yet available commercially and we had uh, this collection classified based on which application from where they came the TRL self-documented uh, that were completely self-documented by research groups so we have more than 70 as of today and you can have statistics here are a few the provenience for instance where they come from many from north america uh, many from asia and of course many from europe because it's uh, uh, you know it, people are submitting their own projects so they were more aware of this in europe um, this is the other statistics that we came up with, and they are all available in the website of this, uh, uh, of this IRE. Um, so examples of these pilot projects. This uh, I Feel You bracelet is a, is a simple device that uses robotics technologies uh, from a, a, a European project for uh, ergonomics to al give alerts to social distancing. So basically when two people come too close together, 
they will vibrate. Uh, another interesting project is this no face touch that the group of Domenico Pratichizzo uh, did. Uh, it's a, a, another very simple idea with a magnet that makes uh, your watch, uh, uh, smartwatch, vibrate when you get too close to your face. But uh, looking forward, uh, there are other projects like this one in the uh, University's Campus Biomedical in, uh, in Rome, where you have this robot that uh, uh, reduces the risk of contamination by uh, sanitizing and uh, bringing uh, devices around the hospital. Uh, many other initiatives, for instance, in agronomy, in agriculture, where, uh, of course, you, we have now the problem of uh, workforce. But let me finish with something that uh, our own group uh, did. Uh, this is the uh, Alter Ego, uh, a mobile robot with functionally anthropomorphic upper body design for physical interaction. This is something that we started before the COVID. It's a humanoid that is uh, self-balancing and that has the features of uh, having the possibility of interacting with the environment with safety and also with people because it has some soft uh, joints and soft hands. And here are a few applications that you might find interesting in assistive, uh, in assisting people. It's a personal robot that you can use as an avatar. And you see here on the right, uh, the person that is in office, remote from the scene, and is sending the robot to take medicines here, upper left, and give them to the person that is at home without getting in contact with her, or serving food, or even meeting the postman when he delivers packages. So those, there are many, many things that you can do in terms of assisting people, but also in terms of uh, physical smart working. Everybody now is doing smart working on their computers, but if we had robots we, can, we could touch and we could interact with the environment through, then we would, we would be able to do uh, real smart working, physical smart working as well. So um, I would like to thank all the people that have contributed to, to these projects uh, and, and thank you also for attention. And I'll be glad to get your questions on this. Antonio, that, that is just so impressive what you all have done, pulling together a collective to work together. And I, I started crying when you first showed that video during the ICRA plenary talk, and I couldn't help but tear up again. The idea of letting families talk and say to their, to their loved ones, the idea that, you know, all these grandmothers have been kidnapped, essentially, what a great way to phrase it. So anyway, thank you. So first question, you, you alluded to it a little bit in your talk. What are the gaps and opportunities you're seeing for robot research for infectious diseases? You showed us some pilot projects, but in the bigger picture, what do you think are the, the big challenges? Well, yeah, I think that this, um, um, there, are, there are many. I, I, I think that uh, one of the things that we need to have is to be ready when these things happen. Uh, and to do this, it's, uh, it's a mix of factors. Uh, we cannot expect the, 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 the most recent ideas that we come up with in our research labs to be available next day, because they have to be many and they have to be everywhere. They have to be available. I think, I think that uh, next time uh, things will be different because now we have realized how important it is not to be bound by our physicity to be there. We can do things from, from, uh, from far away. So this will change our field for, for, for long time. But to do this, we need, of course, many robots. but We also need many people because those robots need not to be completely autonomous. They cannot be completely autonomous. Of course, there is intelligence in these avatars that I showed. There is intelligence even in the telepresence robots because it can navigate the environment. But there is a person, 
and it's uh, and it's an important person that is behind the robot because in care you need the doctor you need the nurse you need people that are managing the interaction of the grandmother with the grandson with uh, a, a human touch because you know did you you've seen that the person at some point has to get back into the conversation and sometimes probably to to ask them you know time is finished we have to move on please conclude your talk and you cannot do that by a robot interaction you you want to have a person that has a human touch um so we have to have a person in there. So we need people in robotics. And this has two implications. One is you need volunteers. But second, most important is that you need robots that can talk to people that are normal people, that are not robotics researchers. So you need that people can use robots like they can use the smartphones now. It's like uh, is is the same uh, uh, difference that uh, was between computers in the 80s, where very few of us could use them, and smartphones today, where everybody can use them, even though they are more powerful. So robots need not only to be more technological advanced, but need to be usable by no normal people, people that have other skills, because we need those skills. And we don't need uh, doctors, we don't need nurses, we don't need uh, operators, we don't need workers to become roboticists. So we have to make our robots usable by normal people. And I think that is the biggest challenge we have in front of us. Yeah, we see that in disaster robotics all the time. Hey, so last question. What's your one piece of advice for a roboticist who is one of these people in the labs and not used to talking to people and stuff, what's your advice for them to get involved in COVID research? Um, my, my experience, I learned to listen. Listen to the people that are in the field. Uh, don't go with your own idea. Most often, your own idea of what is useful is wrong. People know what, what it is useful. We have to be more humble to share the fact that, uh, yes, we know maybe how to write a program or how to build a robot, but we don't really know any better than them what the need is. So my piece of advice is be ready to listen. Thank you. And the humility of one of the top roboticists in the world, it's, it's so inspiring. So thank you very much for sharing with us. And I can't wait to see what iRIM learns in the next few months. And to our viewers, please check out the other videos and information at roboticsforinfectiousdiseases.org.